In this video, I want to show you how I would approach data analysis for manufacturing data. I truly wish I had known this when I was working with data that looked exactly like this. But hopefully, now you can apply this and use this in your work. Let's get started. In the example that I brought today, we're creating a tablet that is being produced in five process steps. These process steps are that I am holding this in a lot where I measure the size of the particles. Everything then goes into milling and I measure mill time and screen size. Then I go into mixing, I measure blend time and blend speed. I have some information on the sub suppliers for different magnesium, lactose, sugar, and telecium. Then the tablet gets compressed and I measure compression force. Finally, it gets a coating where I measure these six parameters. I am following the dissolution of this tablet. So that's really the quality aspect that we're gonna looking at today. So if we take a look at the data, you can see that I have dissolutions in a column. I have the lot number and I have whether or not that lot has been accepted. So if I right click here on the reject, I can see that I actually have quite a few that has been rejected. And if we were to look at this in a control chart, that control chart will look something like this. So this is an individual chart of my dissolutions. And we can see that we have these periods where we're producing auto specification batches. Uh, we then get, we do some improvements. We manage to stay within specification, but again comes along a period where we're producing auto specification batches again. We did some improvements, not actually, not sure how, but we managed to stay above spec for some time. And now we're going into the third period of where we're producing a lot of auto specification batches. So of course we need to come up with a more lasting solution. And we're gonna try and see if we can do that today. When we're working in QC in a pharmaceutical business, what we often then have to look at is whether we've been producing these within, within the required specification set on the process. So in order to do that, I've had this kind of process screening where I rank all my continuous variables as a function of PPK or CPK. If you are uncertain what these numbers mean, uh, I have a video that explains how these are calculated. So go give that a watch if you're unsure of this, uh, of these numbers. But we can quickly see that some of these are produced with PPK values that are not optimal. So that's maybe something we need to, to look into. Another way of looking at the same is, is this kind of report where we have what's called a goal plot. And a goal plot is where we just plot all our processes. So these boxes are our continuous processes. And we can see that this one is quite far off. And so everything within the green area has PPK of one. So we see this one does not. And we can look, okay, that's mill time. We can click on it and get a control chart just for that. Maybe just quickly go ahead and say, I want to see the spec limits on here. Okay, so some of these are indeed definitely close to getting out of spec. So I can highlight them like so. Let's just try and color these. So we're going to go rose, row color, color them a nice purple. So if we go back and look at our control chart, well, these are the points and it's not really giving me a very good story because you can see that some of these are outside spec, but some of these are inside spec. So maybe that's not all there is to it. Uh, we, we, not, we might need to dig a little deeper than just looking at um, at mill time by itself. Uh, we can try and take a look at, at this one now, and, and it's it's quite nice. It is showing us how wide the box plots in the distributions of each of these are in comparisons to its own specification limit. So what does that mean? Well, that means mill times production width fills up quite a lot of its own specification window, but force does not. So, so we can say like force and mill time are maybe two we wanna try and look at. So we can go back here and say mill time and force. Let's just look at control charts for selected items. And we see that picture that if we put on some, some spec limits here, that mill time is filling up a lot and you skew it towards the lower. And if you put limits on here as well, that force is really narrow and, and quite close to target. So 
So can we, was that how, what we saw? Just close to one, this one down again. So mill time skewed towards the lower spec and quite broad, yes. And force is quite narrow and is close to the center. So it's just really nice visualizing how are these these processes running in comparison to their own spec limits. So of course these have been standard standardized using uh, each own spec limits. When you see inlet temperature seems to be one of those that are actually outside specification. Um, so maybe we want to keep an eye on that. Next off, I would want to create kind of a where I have dissolution, which is my quality aspect on the Y, and every possible X on the X axis. So I've done this by applying a column switcher. So when I click through here, you see I change the X axis and I can just quickly go through and see if there's, so this one looks quite interesting. You can see that, let's just color these point by whether or not they have been rejected. So let's go to control panel, take the acceptance, put that into color. That's, an, that's nice. Done. So we can really see now that uh, most of the auto specification boxes are produced at screen size five. So maybe that's worth worth noting. We can go a little further. Not so much. And I'm just looking at this line, seeing whether there's a big difference. Not the case at all. Okay, so here's here's something. It seems like mill time at a low setting has a higher, is, is uh, scrapping a lot of uh, batches. And it also seems that over here we're scrapping some batches. So maybe we have this kind of curvature effect, which might be showing off in our, in this kind of bump we have on the road. Blend time. No, no. Negative trend, maybe. But this is not like this is a nice way for to quickly see. Also, here we can see are those outliers? Why have then they been sprayed at such a high velocity? Um, was that a mistake or what happened there? Um, it's really just a quickly and nice visualization. But of course, we want to get some more deeper answers. So, in the next tab, I've made the predictor screening. And what the predictor screening shows us is it ranks my 17 factors on how good they are at explaining variation in my dissolution. So I have like, these are my top performers or said in other words, these are the ones that are really explaining variation in the dissolution. So based on that, we can, and this was some of the things we already saw when we we're looking at the graph. So screen size and mill time, if you remember screen size, Okay, I can understand why that is driving a lot of the ex either variation. Mill time, the same one as well. What was the next one? Spray rate. Yeah, see that negative trend there. Um, but what I really want to do then is take my top performers and make that into a model. So here's the model I created based on those five top performers. And I can really see again that screen size driving a lot of the variation. Uh, so I need to keep that on three because that's 80 here. And if I go there, it's only 75. That's a big difference. Uh, again, we're seeing that curvature for military time we, we, uh, we also saw in the graph builder. Um, but the real problem here is that coating viscosity is not something that I can control. It's a liquid that is being supplied to us. So sometimes it comes in with a high viscosity and sometimes it has a low viscosity. And if I have a, a high viscosity, you see, well, I'm, I'm in spec, but if I get a coating viscosity at a really low level, I am out of specification. But the good news here is that if I then adjust the spraying rate, you see how that drives that coating viscosity into spec again. So what does that mean? Well, that means I have an interaction between coating viscosity and spraying rate. And in order to find and work with these kind of interactions, which are, which are quite common, um, we need to be losing, using multivariate analysis like this. So the good news here is that if I just could, could spray at 390, I'm actually robust for any level of coating viscosity. The only issue I have is when I have a low viscosity and I'm trying to spray at a high rate. If I can just not do that, I should be happy. 
In another video, I'll explain how I set this analysis up so you can follow along and do this yourself. But thanks for watching. I hope you saw something useful. Catch you in the next one. Bye.